Okay, thank you. So hopefully I'm going to start off with some good news. So the emissions globally have slowed down, and does this mean we're on the way to two degrees? So many of you have probably heard that we've had three years of pretty much zero growth in uh, global emissions. This is a little bit unexpected. We've had a quite long period of emissions growth, um, particularly rapid through the 2000s and then sort of levelling off now. But what this means, if it's a good thing or a bad thing, we really need to understand why have emissions slowed down. And when we understand why, then we can say something a little bit more about where emissions might go in the future. But to understand why at the global level is a little bit difficult because the global is the sum of many different countries and in each country you're going to get some different dynamics. So it helps a little bit to zoom in to the country level and see what's happening at the country level. And there's more good news, Chinese emissions may have peaked, as some say. Uh, so China, the orange here, is uh, full of surprises. Around 2000, it had this extraordinary growth of 8-10% per year, the steep part of the curve. No one expected that. Likewise, in 2013 or so, Chinese emissions stopped growing. They've even gone down. No one really expected that. Why has this happened? Primarily, I'd argue it's economic factors. There's been an over, overcapacity in the Chinese market, drop in construction activities. Construction requires a lot of steel and cement and electricity and therefore coal. So coal consumption has dropped somewhat in China. The US has uh, had emissions trending downwards for the last 10 years or so. Why? Since the financial crisis, GDP growth, economic activity has been a little bit lower than, than previously. But also in the US, we've got cheap gas and a lot of support for uh, solar and wind. And these two are eating into coal, coal share of the energy mix. And this is helping US emissions go down. European emissions in the blue have been flat for an extended period. A little bit uh, accelerated decrease in the last uh, sort of five, ten years. Why? Similar to the US, there's been lower economic growth after the financial crisis in 2008. There's more support for renewables, energy efficiency, and that's heading emissions down. India, different story. Rapid economic growth, demand for energy. That's putting demand on coal. There's also some positive news in terms of solar. But India is a king is still coal in India, so emissions are expected to rise in the future. And of course, there's another 200 odd countries there with emissions going up and down. So what I've basically been doing in the last few minutes is tracking progress of those countries, trying to understand and explain what's going on. And earlier this year, we had a paper come out which is exactly about that, tracking progress, particularly in the context of the, the Paris Agreement. And I'll sort of talk through some of the things that we did in, in that paper. So when you want to understand emissions, what's causing emissions to change, one approach is you can take every factor that might affect emissions, put it in the black box, shake the box around and try and figure out what factor is affecting which other factor and it gets very complex and hard to determine what's the cause of what. So we've taken a very simple approach, like a baby step approach, and we have this nested structure. So first of all, we'll look at something very easy. For example, what's happening with the CO2 emissions, just like I showed you. We can go into a, another level of detail called the Kaya identity. Kaya was a Japanese guy who developed this, this concept. I've got a sort of more simplified version here, which basically says CO2 emissions are a combination of economic activity times the energy intensity times the carbon intensity. You multiply those terms together and you get CO2 emissions. And so you can use this simple identity to decompose what's going on at the next sort of level of complexity. Of course, we're researchers, we want to go into more detail. We can break down different terms, you know, is there coal to gas affecting it? Is it growth in renewables? We can go down further and further, looking at different technologies. We can start to look at cost data, um, where are cost trends going, and, and so on and so forth. I won't get into those complexities, but I'll talk a little bit about this one. I'll use China as an example um, because of this recent slowdown in Chinese emissions. It's a very simple, uh, very nice example. And I'll link it to China's emissions pledge under the Paris Agreement, which is to peak uh, Chinese emissions by 2030 and to decrease the emission intensity, the CO2 per unit economic activity, by 60-65% below 2005 levels by 2030. There's other factors as well, but I'm not going to talk about those. <coughs> 
So here's a nice complex figure that researchers like to show, but I'm just going to talk you through it. And this is showing the Kaya identity. The black line here is CO2 emissions growth. Emissions were growing most rapidly, as I said before, in the middle of the 2000s, about 8% per year. And emissions growth has declined around about no, no growth, zero growth in emissions at the end of the period. If you add these terms together, you will get the, CO, the black line, the CO2 emissions. So what's causing emissions to change? GDP growth, which has been around 10% for an extended period, is starting to, to get lower and lower. Less GDP growth, less energy demand, et cetera, et cetera. Also, China is improving its energy intensity. This purple part has been negative the whole time, which means energy efficiency is improving. Uh, it's slowed down a little bit in the 2000s. It's starting to speed up again, but still lower than earlier periods. This CO2 per energy component, this orange component, is essentially the growth in renewables in, in China, which is also helping emissions to go down. So these factors here offset the growth in GDP. If you compare to what the emission pledge says, this 60 to 65% means about 3 4% per year reduction in emission intensity, uh, which is the, the purple and the orange. And so China is starting to exceed that level. So China is on progress, you could say. This figure shows Chinese emissions over a, a longer period. The, the vertical line splits the past and the future. And if you combine those emission intensity targets that I said with assumptions about GDP growth, you'll find Chinese emissions will peak 2025 as in their pledge. This is all consistent. But you'll see the growth from the emissions pledge in the future is somewhat inconsistent with this slowdown in emissions. Maybe Chinese emissions have peaked already. And if you think about that previous figure, it essentially explains why. We get an earlier peak in emissions if there's faster declines in emission intensity. This is happening in China. Slower GDP growth. This is happening in China. So we have a combination of both, which means that the peak will come earlier if those uh, trends continue. It is somewhat silly talking about a peak in some senses when we know that emissions need to go down about the same rate that they went up if we want to stay at two degrees. So peaking is not enough. Emissions need to go zero and rather rapidly. And that's more of the challenge than the peaking. So moving forward, looking at future pathways, and I'm going back to the global level now. Here's a rather complex figure. I'm not going to go through it in detail. There's 1,200 or so scenarios here that were assessed by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. 100 or so of them are consistent with two degrees. So this is where our emissions need to go to be consistent with this Paris goal. And this is where the emission pledges under the Paris Agreement roughly take us. So sort of, you know, maybe in a domain which is consistent with two degrees, but very rapid um, separation of where we're going and where we need to go. We can zoom into a few technologies. Um, this one is about solar and wind. So this is the deployment of solar and wind. Historically, this is the black line, and these colours here are different scenarios, two degree scenarios. Don't worry about the colours. And you can see the deployment of wind and solar is tracking reasonably well with these two-degree scenarios. We need to keep accelerating to go up to this path, but we're on progress. We're doing well on the wind and solar side. Carbon capture and storage, the, IPC, the scenarios assessed by the IPCC have rather extreme carbon capture and storage. These lines go up very steeply. These are huge numbers. I won't go into the details. Relatively speaking, we have very little carbon capture and storage. So if we're going to take these pathways with high carbon capture and storage, we need to get onto these pathways up here, which is extremely challenging, if not impossible. These are rather extreme levels of deployment. So that's a sort of a gap in progress. So just summing up my last slide. <laughs> the recent slowdown in emissions is great news, but the gains are not guaranteed, and so we need some policy to lock in those gains and make sure that it is a peak in global emissions. China is very important in that story, and maybe we're seeing lots of... Uh, stars align in China. There's structural change in the economy, air pollution concerns, renewables, all these coming together at the same time may accelerate emissions down. As one of my colleagues says, Oliver Geddon, it's always five minutes to midnight. We can always get to two degrees, it seems. But we need to have quite rapid deployment of wind and solar and other renewables. And we're going to need some really big technologies, the sort of really heavy lifters, things like CCS or nuclear and, and so on. <coughs> 
and we're behind progress on those, those areas. Thank you. Thank you.